Hello everybody, welcome to the first lecture for forestry skills, which is just an introduction to the forestry skills class and the different topics that we will discuss. So let's get into it. So the first slide that I have here is a quote that says, you never know if you can actually do something against all odds until you actually do it. And I think that that's important to know for this class because um, it's a this class is going to be a math intensive class it's going to teach you um, maybe some stuff you knew before maybe some stuff you didn't know and the big thing that I want you guys to um, just kind of take take charge of or or really just grab a hold of is this idea of a growth mindset and the idea that you know, you can do these things. You just have to do them sometimes. They're going to be hard. They're going to be difficult. It's not things aren't going to go the way you want them to, but you just, you do it, and you do it to the best of your abilities, and eventually you'll get there. So, our learning objectives for today. We're going to talk about um, different types of errors that we might make. Uh, understanding the difference uh, between accuracy and precision because they're not the same thing. Understanding uh, different units of distance, area, and measurement. And understanding why all of that is necessary for forestry and why we, why we want to know that stuff for measuring the forest. So let's start off with why do we measure things? Well, it helps us provide essential knowledge in decision making. Um, things like uh, knowing elevation, where we are um, above sea level, because it'll help us know uh, what trees are supposed to be growing in that certain area or why something grows better than something else does. Um, we certainly would want to know distances between things. Uh, one place where that um, becomes really important is uh, spacing between our trees, because when we plant our trees, we're planting small seedlings. But those seedlings are going to grow up into big full-size trees, so we need to make sure that we plant them at a far enough spacing that we um, encourage competition, but we don't um, have them all competing so much that they that they um, kill each other off. Uh, and then angles. Angles are going to be important in terms of direction, in terms of compass and pacing, and being able to, to measure the forest and navigate through the forest. Uh, we'll want to know things like uh, the size of land parcels. So how do we figure that out? Well, we got to use um, either compass and pacing, or we got to use a GPS, or we've got to use um, GIS, Geographic Information Systems, which is something that we're going to go over in this class. Uh, we'll want to know um, things like positional information. So where we are on the earth, where is this property? Um, what's it uh, near um, and um, other things in terms of like the borders of the property like where exactly is my property that's a big thing for people uh, who own forests but the the biggest overall idea behind why do we need to measure things is we want to have information to make informed decisions that's what that's why that term exists an informed decision a decision with lots of information so that you can make the best decision possible So why do we why do you need to know this for forestry? So with measurements, it's very important for for us to know what do we have. So what 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 is it? So do we have you know 145,000 acres? Do we have five acres? Do we have half an acre of land? How many tre trees on it? Do we have uh, seedlings? Do we have trees? Are they big trees? Are they small trees? Is there a bunch? of small trees or is there just a few big trees all that's really good information where is it so where is this is it in california is it in bakersfield is it in kern county is it um you know half a mile north of bakersfield or you know is it six miles east of the airport all of it all those sorts of things are going to be very specific to help us out in figuring this out and how much of it is there so what do we have, where is it, and how much of it is there? So it's very important to know, do we have um, a bunch of small little trees, or do we have 
a few big trees or do we have a bunch of middle sized trees that's going to be really important in in helping us make our decisions as to what we do because if you just say well here's this piece of land it's it's i don't know it's it's outside of town somewhere and it's like you know it's a few acres and it's got some good sized trees on it okay that that tells me very little actually in terms of being able to help figure out what i'm dealing with it's much different than if you say well there's this piece of land it's um halfway between bakersfield and tehachapi it's um about 10 acres and it's got um, trees ranging from uh, 18 to 24 inches in dbh and they're all the heights are somewhere between um, 60 to 85 feet tall that would be much different i can i can start figuring things out i i can picture that tree in my head and so that that really becomes important that that extra bit of of really getting an understanding of what do we have where is it how much of it is there uh location 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 in real estate it's extremely important and in uh forestry it's extremely important um not so much for the same reason that it's important in real estate but more in the idea of if i know where my trees are then i can start figuring out okay well if my trees are here then my closest mill is here and so if i'm going to get these trees and i'm going to get them processed um then that's the closest mill well what kind of a mill is that is that a sawmill is that a pulp mill is that a biofuel mill because then that starts telling me well maybe i was going to grow saw timber trees but if it's a pulp mill which takes only small trees then maybe i've got to think about shorter rotations to try and make more money because the sawmill might be twice as far away and my biggest cost is going to be transportation and all of a sudden you see how these numbers all start becoming important and that's the idea of it um, of knowing all this stuff because we want to be able to manage the land but to manage the land we've got to have information and lots of it we've got to be able to be be able to put numbers to all of these decisions because when you have the numbers you feel very good about the decisions you're making if somebody knocks on my door and just says hey i see the the trees you got on uh on this piece of land uh what if i just go cut them down uh, and i give you some money for it is it a good deal is it a bad deal if i don't have those numbers i have no idea but if I have, if I know, well, you know, oh, this piece of land you're talking about over there, oh, well, that's 40 acres and um, that's pretty mature timber on it. Uh, you know, the nearest sawmill is here. So, you know, what's what price are you offering me? And, you know, then all of a sudden you feel like you're making a good informed decision. So let's talk about um, some errors that that can be made um, so the first one um, in terms of measurements that can be made is a blunder and when we talk about a blunder that's that's just where we just kind of make a mistake um, the example I have right here is you write down 51 instead of 15 or you meant to say west but you wrote down east so we want to avoid blunders so just take your time and double check what you wrote down uh, another error that we have is systematic error, where you get um, repeated errors caused by improper calibration of an instrument. Sometimes that instrument might be your own brain, but hopefully not. Um, but the reason we can tell it's systematic error as opposed to a blunder is because every measurement is off by, by the same sort of magnitude. Um, it also can be caused by the environment, so certain tools like... Um, some uh, there's an instrument uh, called the loggers tape and that's a it's a metal uh, measuring tape and so because it's metal if it's certain times of the year or that it's really hot or really cold it can shrink in the cold so you might get a different measurement um, by having to by the tension that you put on that piece of metal during the different parts of the year um, we can avoid systematic error by making sure our instruments are properly calibrated. 
And um, if if it is a really systematic error and the errors are so consistent enough that we pick up the pattern, then we can um, we are going to be able to systematically um, correct those errors. But prevention is way better than trying to figure out um, the correction scheme. So blunders, blunders we can fix by taking our time and double checking. Systematic error, hopefully if it's um, a very systematic error, it's very noticeable and we can fix it. Random error. Random error might be caused by equipment limitations or by the operator. Um, it reflects an inability to make an exact measurement and it becomes a problem for us because we don't know why it's all over the place. It's, there's, there's nothing obvious as to why it's, we've, we've missed all over the place. What, what we found is that it, there's no sort of pattern, no rhyme or reason. And so, um, this might not be a big thing, but the problem is it could be a big error. And we want to avoid random error as much as possible because with random error, we can't really fix it. We don't know why, why, or there's no rhyme or reason to make it say, okay, well, we can do this and then we can fix it. And so we really want to avoid random error as much as possible. Blunders, we can fix. Systematic error, we can fix. Random error, really hard for us to fix. Accuracy and precision. So when we're talking about accuracy and precision, let me move this out of the way. Now I'm down here. Um, when we're talking about accuracy and precision, uh, accuracy, uh, the definition of accuracy is deviation from the true value. Precision, on the other hand, is deviation from the other values. And so when we're talking about having high accuracy, we're talking about how close is your measurement or your estimation to the true value. Or in the instance of this picture, how close are you to the center of the target? Whereas the, your precision is your deviation from other values. So how close are all your other estimations or all your other estimates? So when we're looking at this target here, our precision um, goes up this way and our accuracy goes up this way. So when we look here, this is where we have high precision and high accuracy in the top right. All of our shots are together and not only are they together, they're in the center. So we have high accuracy because we are right in the center of the target. We are right near the true value that we're trying to hit. But we also have high precision because all of our different shots or all of our different measurements are, are all clustered together. And we can see over here, we on the on the top left, that we have high precision because all of our shots or all of our measurements are together, but we do not have high accuracy because we are not near the center. We are not near what we want in terms of our true value. Down here on the bottom right, we've got high accuracy, but we've got low precision because we are near the true value but our our measurements or our shots they're not near each other so we've got low precision and here this looks a lot like our random error for before where we've got low precision and low accuracy because we're not near the center or the true value that we're looking for and our shots aren't near each other so when we're talking about accuracy and precision, they're two different things. When we're talking about being accurate, we're talking about how close are we to our true value. Whereas when we're talking about um, being precise, uh, you have to have multiple measurements in there. And it's how close are our measurements to each other is high precision. Move myself back up here. There we go. So to obtain, up to obtain acceptable precision and accuracy, we definitely want to eliminate all blunders. The way we can do that, we can um, proof our data, make sure we're properly trained um, before heading into the field, and have careful note taking when we're in, in the field. Uh, we want to eliminate systematic error by frequent calibration of our instruments. 
including our brains, making sure that we uh, always check our equipment and that we're, um, we've got a good understanding of how we're measuring things. And then we want to reduce random error by using the proper equipment and measurement procedures and having consistency in the way that we do things. The more consistent we can be in our process, the more deliberate we can be in our process, the more um, fine-tuned our behavior is every time we're out there measuring, the more chance there is to reduce random error. We can't really um, reduce uh, random error completely. It's always going to be there, but we can eliminate it as much as possible. And so that's what we want to do in terms of trying to deal with error. We want to reduce error as much as possible. We can eliminate um, blunders and systematic errors, but at least reduce it down as much as possible. So the first, uh, first part of the forestry skills class is going to deal with uh, maps, navigation, and orienteering. So why do we use maps? Well, the big idea with maps is just help us know where we are, help us know where we're trying to go to. Uh, in this example here, I can show you the map on the right, and it's just, okay, there's the Mount Pinos hiking trail. Well, but, like, where is that, and what is that? Whereas if I show you this map on the left, and it's like, oh, Bakersfield College, there's Bakersfield, south of town on I-5, so we're into the, the grapevine. Okay, so that's Fraser Park area, and that's the Los Padres National Forest. So maps can give us a lot of information, and maps can help us uh, where we're going. And for forestry, they become extremely important because when you get into the forest, a lot of the time, everything kind of looks the same. And that's why people get lost sometimes out there. Is everything just kind of looks the same, so you really have to have a good idea of where you're going and how you're getting there and how you're getting back. And maps are going to be a great tool in helping with that. So what kind of maps are we going to use? Well, all sorts of different ones. Um, more than likely, the maps you'll see the um, most used in forestry are uh, combination maps, uh, boundary and resource surveys, things that are really going to help you make uh, informed decisions when it comes to management. So this example I have here, it's um, from Oregon, I believe, a Bureau of Land Management map, and it's uh, showing a proposed thinning project. And so they're going to go in there and they're going to cut out some trees. And so what do we see? We see, um, we see the home range for an animal. So um, that's that's important because we want to think about the wildlife because remember going back to the things we've learned in introduction to forestry is the forest is the trees and everything below them. So you see we got A, B, C, and D here. It says those are activity center alternates because we got this, uh, this um, bird icon right here is the activity center. Uh, we've got our home range. We've got the proposed CFP units. You can see those up there that some of them are within that home range. You can see the thinning projects are the green out here. So those are the areas that are going to get thinned. And then they have the other thinning projects in blue, which I don't see. And that's going to bring up a good point about maps, which I think is worth mentioning. And that's the idea that things on your map and things on your legend should always match up. And if you look at your legend and you don't see it on your map, then it shouldn't be on your legend. Um, and then we see also these colors. So it says forested stand age classes. So the dark green is 80 plus years, light green 60 to 70 years, orange 40 to 59 years, and yellow 0 to 39 years. So Lots of different pieces of information on the map. And then we can see some topographic relief in the background as well. And then we've got some other information, uh, some conversions, and uh, some other information in terms of um, other treatments and the proposed amount of treatments in the, the habitat uh, for the, the critical animal. So we maps can be pretty simple like just looking on your phone and saying hey i want to go from 
uh, Bakersfield College to Jack in the Box. What's the quickest way to get there? Pretty simple. Whereas a map like this, lots of different information uh, put in it, but all of it important. Don't forget your units. So, first question I have written up here, what does five mean? It means absolutely nothing without a unit attached to it. And that's going to be big when we're talking about maps and when we're talking about uh, measurements. Really make sure that you have units attached to numbers. Don't ever tell me a number without a unit attached to it. You just say, oh, yeah, well, there's 40. 40 what? People? Goats? Miles? Acres? Really important to make sure we have units attached to everything. A unit, by definition, is any division of quantity accepted as a standard of measurement or exchange. So uh, length and distance units, inches, feet, centimeters, meters, miles, elevation, feet, meters, uh, angles, degrees, minutes, seconds. And we're going to definitely go over degrees, minutes, seconds when we do our um, compass and pacing lab and learning how to use a hand compass. The Earth's Curvature. We'll briefly cover this when it comes to maps. So maps are flat, but the Earth is not. If um, you believe that it is, I'm very sorry uh, to tell you that this is a science-based class and we understand that the Earth is not flat. So surveys that extend over smaller areas, so think less than 300 square miles, do not need to correct for the curvature of the Earth. So this is going to be important when you're looking at some maps because some maps are going to come out perfect and um, easy and everything's lined up. And then some maps that are going to be covering really big areas, like larger than 300 square miles, things are going to be slightly off. Or you're going to see a line that goes like this straight across and then all of a sudden it goes like that. And that's because um, we're trying to take a 3D object like the Earth and put it just on a 2D flat surface. And um, that flat surface, that's called plane surveying. And the big idea is that it's hard to make the map line up on 3D to 2D. So we really want to um, make sure that when we're looking at maps that deal with large areas, there's going to be slight, we're going to have to just understand they're going to be slightly off because we're adjusting for the Earth's curvature. So, um, here it's a nice picture of being able to see that actual curvature and just understanding that its um, surveys extending over the large areas have to account for the Earth's curvature. Otherwise, um, it's going to be really hard to navigate using those maps. Our second part of this class is going to be forest measurements and uh, specifically standing tree measurements. Uh, in the background here, this person is taking a DBH or a diameter at breast height. Uh, diameter by breast at breast height by definition is four and a half feet off of the ground. And so what we're really trying to do there is get the diameter or the width of the tree. So the purpose of forest measurements, we want to answer these questions. What do we have? Where is it? How much of it is there? Sounds familiar. How are we going to accomplish this? Well, we love numbers. So we want to get tables, figures, maps, all of these things that can tell us um, what we need to know. So I've got a map uh, here on the right. Here is the stand I'm interested in. There's a trail that goes through the stand here marked off and so I see all of these different trees. Now if I'm good at maps and I understand maps I can see oh look it's spaced out so we're gonna have some bigger trees that are that are spaced out as opposed to um, when I see something like this where there's gonna be smaller trees um, stuck in a lot of rows so lots of big trees over here and then I will got tables that'll help me out so I know that if I have a 10 inch tree in dbh it's going to have 45 board feet in it uh, board feet being how many um, boards we can actually 
get out of the, that tree. So if we have a 10 inch tree, we can get 45 feet of boards out of that tree. If we had a 28 inch tree, according to this table, we could get 200 board feet out of it. And so we want to have all these different tables, figures, maps, and we're going to take that with the information that we get off of the trees, and we're going to put it all together, and then we're going to come up with our own tables that'll say things like how many trees per acre, and how much volume per acre, and how much basal area per acre we have um, in the stand on average, so we'll be able to make some informed decisions. So why do we want to measure the forest? Well, the really big idea is we need to know what's out there. We need to have a knowledge of our timber resources if we're going um, to be able to, to manage them well. We want to know the location, the volume, the species distribution. It's got to be quantified. It's got to be put numerically to make informed and sound decisions. If we can't measure it, we can't manage it. If we can't measure it, you can't manage it because you're not doing any management unless you know what is out there. So the role of measurements really comes down to the idea of it's to supply needed numerical data to make management decisions. Um, usually there's a focus on production or a focus on conservation or a focus on production and conservation of timber resources. But trying to paint the picture for you, take a look at this picture at the bottom of the slide and just ask yourself, how do we look at this picture and make sense of it? Because for me, I can look at that picture and start to make sense of it. I can see things like, okay, that area got clear cut. This area has got smaller trees on it. So that was, this one's been cut recently. That one was cut a few years ago. These larger stands, those ones haven't been cut in a while. Okay, I'm seeing multiple colors here, so more than likely those are uh, hardwood trees, not evergreen trees, because I know evergreen trees don't change color. Or if this is an area with evergreen trees, then I know that there's some sort of problem going on there, some sort of beetle kill, something like that. I know that the trees that haven't been cut, those are going to be bigger trees. The ones... Um, in the middle there. Uh, those are going to be smaller seedling type trees. So uh, lots of little trees on the middle one, the uh, less trees per acre, but much bigger trees on the other ones. And I start, I can start to figure that out. But that's my whole goal with you guys in this class is to try and to get you to be able to look at a picture like this and have it start making sense in your head. So where are we measuring when we're taking these measurements? Well, um, there's three terms that you'll hear um, quite often in forestry. You'll hear the term forest. You'll hear the term tract, tract with a T at the end, not a K, and then stand. So a forest is a large area covered chiefly with trees and undergrowth. That's the Google definition of it. We know that for me, I define the forest as the trees and everything below them, um, but that's different. A tract. A tract is defined as an area of indefinite extent, typically a large one. Um, and then we have in quotations here, large tracts of natural forest. So when people use the, the term tract, it, it's an area that they have deemed um, to be within a certain boundary. So usually if somebody's talking about a tract of land, then I say, well, do you have a map? Or can you show me the boundaries or something so I can get an idea of what I'm looking at? And then you have this, a stand, a contiguous group of trees sufficiently uniform in age class distribution, composition, and structure, and growing on a site of sufficient uniformity to be a distinguishable unit. And that's the Society of American Foresters definition. And so the way I really like to think of it is um, our smallest unit that we're going to deal with uh, is a stand. So you'll get... Um, the basal area per acre, the trees per acre, the volume per acre of a stand. You're going to have multiple stands within a tract, and you can have multiple tracts within a forest. Um, if you're dealing with private landowners, probably you're only going to talk about stands and tracts. If you're dealing with the government, you might talk about stands and tracts and forests and maybe even um, other um, 
other land areas as well, like um, fire management units or other things like that. How are we going to measure the forest? Uh, we're going to do an inventory. So uh, inventory is the end results of the measurement or a summation, uh, summation of data. And the objective when we're doing inventories is to obtain an estimate of acceptable statistical precision for the lowest possible expenditure. Or can I say that in a less fancy way? Sure. I want to get the best possible data and I want to spend the least amount of money and time doing it. And I think a lot of people want to do, I think that's the goal for working for a lot of people. I want to get as much as I can out of this area and out of my work. And I want to spend the least amount of time and the least amount, the least amount of money doing it. Um, so we, we want an inventory. And so how are we going to get an inventory? We're going to do uh, timber cruising. So the object of timber cruising is to provide reliable estimates for timber appraisals. Um, the timber volume estimate serves as the basis for payment on tree measurement sales. And so the idea is um, we're going to go out there. We're going to make take some measurements, make some estimates during our timber cruise. After our timber cruise, we're going to come back, work up the numbers, come up with a inventory, and then that inventory is going to give us our data. And our data should then give us, along with maybe a map of the area, or if there isn't a map, then do the measurements to make a map of the area. And then we'll have our information where we can answer our three big questions of um, what do we have, where is it, and how much of it is out there. So what measurements are we trying to get? I'm going to move myself again. So we're trying to get um, distance measurements. Uh, we might try to get area measurements, standing tree measurements, uh, volume measurements, and or sorry, volume estimates, and weight estimates. And the reason why I specifically say um, volume estimates and weight estimates is more than likely we're doing um, a, we're doing um, indirect measurements to get those numbers. So when we do distance and area measurements, uh, you're going to hear a couple um, terms to get really familiar with. Uh, chains. So a chain is going to be 66 feet. So 66 feet equals one chain. Um, 10 square chains equals an acre. An acre is also equal to 43,560 square feet. And so I'd get comfortable with all of those um, conversions. One chain equals 66 feet. 10 square chains equals an acre. One acre equals 43,560 feet. Very uh, useful information when we're making, going to do distance and area measurements in forestry. Here's some more conversions. Uh, with the first lab, uh, you'll have a um, conversions sheet that'll have some of these common conversions on there for you. So in terms of our inventory methods, we're going to have um, three types of inventory methods. We're going to have direct measurements. So diameter at breast height, that's a direct measurement because I'm there and I'm going to physically touch the tree, wrap my tape around it, and say, all right, this is an 8-inch tree, this is a 16-inch tree, this is a 24-inch tree. Uh, we're going to have sampling, uh, either random or stratified sampling. Um, and when we do sampling, we want to be representative. So um, let's say we have a 400-acre piece of property. Well, if it's worth a lot of money and they want you to go measure every single tree, then that's what you'll do. But more than likely, that would take way too much time. Because let's just think about it here. Let's say let's say there was 100 trees per acre. But if it's 400 acres and there's 100 trees per acre, well, we got two zeros and two more zeros. So that's four zeros at the end. Four times one is four. So we got four and four zeros. That's a lot of trees. And that's just if it was only 100 trees per acre. And so when you think about that, and you think about the idea of 
how much time would it take me to measure 40,000 trees? It's too much time. So um, you might go and get something that's represented, do a representative sample. So maybe you'll get a tenth of the property. Well, um, if you say, oh, well, instead of 40,000 trees, you know, maybe I'll get, um, you know, 4,000 trees. Well, that's still a lot. So maybe that might be too much. Maybe maybe I've got to go sample just a hundredth of the property. Well, 400 trees. Well, I can do that. Well, now you really got to understand. So if time-wise I can, I have enough time to go sample 400 trees, um, but I don't have enough time to go sample 4,000 trees. Okay, well, how much am I going to lose in terms of statistical precision and how good is my estimate going to be about those 40,000 trees um, by these 400? And so if you're going to do that, you really got to make sure, well, I got to go to all the different parts of the property and I really got to make sure that I get a good representative sample of all the different areas and all the different things going on. So you, we kind of have to, you have to really have a good plan before you go and do an inventory, you can't just rock out there and just, all right, let me start measuring some trees and see what happens. You really got to look at the property, see um, the different areas, see how um, the trees are growing and if they're going to be different or they're all going to be the same. If you have an area where every tree is basically exactly the same, you only need one measurement. If every tree is the same, I need to measure one tree. You need to figure out how big the area is, the spacing between the trees, and I'm done. But if you get to an area and all the trees are different, and they're all different sizes, and you got a bunch of different things going on, then it's really going to, um, you're going to have to spend a lot more time there. You're going to have to measure a lot more trees to really get a good sample of what's going on on that tract of land or in that stand. And then we also have estimation and prediction uh, methods, which uh, talked about earlier, the idea of volume and weight estimates, because we're not going to go out there and measure a tree and go, well, that's 145 board feet, or, well, that's a 200-pound tree. We're going to have to get um, DBH, and we're going to have to get height, and we're going to have to get bark thickness and, and all these different measurements, and then... We're going to be able to put that together and get a weight estimate or a volume estimate. Statistics will become hugely important in terms of uh, doing an inventory. We're in this class going to co focus more on um, the actual measurements of the tree. So I'm going to show you. Uh, I'm going to show you like an inventory. Uh, uh, system to where the math is done for you uh, but just know that uh, statistics and mathematics are extremely important because we're talking about sampling and so we've got to apply what we learned about a little area to the whole area and so that's going to um, be done using statistics. So what knowledge are we trying to gain from the measurements that we take in the forest? Well we want to be able to figure out what products we have, um, do we have pulpwood, which is going to be um, small trees? Do we have chip and saw or CNS? Are we going to have um, saw timber sized trees, so large trees? Are we going to have veneer, which is a certain cut that we can get off of some trees? Uh, the attributes from the trees, we want to know um, what's our average DBH, what's our average height, what's the average age of the trees, what's the average bark thickness, what's the average crown length and width. Um, we want to be able to get the volume or weight um, within a stand so that we know if we want to sell this land and we want to cut down the trees and we want to end up um, selling um, these trees that we'll get uh, a certain amount for them. And, and that way we can also, um, there's a lot of places that use um, timber as an investment or um, people who have timber as a uh, retirement fund or the, to pay for their kids college and it's based off of these estimates that we can get in these stands um, and then we also want to know or be able to tell past growth and future growth and be able to kind of say all right well if you're going to grow these trees out you can grow these trees out for the next 15 years then you can look to cut them down in the next five years past that you can replant and then you can do another 
30 or 40 year cycle. And that way we, we start thinking also about the, the conservation of the land and not just the idea of, oh, we're out there to cut down trees and make money. No, we're out there to take care of the land. We're introducing a disturbance on the land, which is important. And then we can, we start looking at the cycles and the timing of the cycles and being able to pat, um, match it up with, um, how that land, um, was in the past. And it's, it's still being able to tie in all this stuff that we knew from forestry before, but now adding numbers to it. Measurement cost considerations are really just the idea of time and money, time and money, because I want to get as much information as I can for the littlest bit of time and money. And so, um, this example right here, high quality black walnut veneer. So that is a product that I can get off of, um, off of black walnut trees. And so because veneer is, um, show wood, so it's stuff that, um, that's going to be on the outside of things like tables or cabinets or, um, or, um, counters, countertops. It's going to be wood that gets shown. People are going to be excited about it and want to pay a lot of money for it. So you can get a black walnut tree, a big good size one, and it might be thousands of dollars for that one tree. Whereas something like loblolly pine pulpwood. Well, pulpwood is what ends up uh, in toilet paper and what ends up in uh, writing paper and what ends up in the inside of a 12 pack, uh, 12 pack uh, soda or beer. And so you're not going to get a lot of money for a bunch of pulpwood trees because that's not the same, it's not the same product on the, on the back end. So if I'm going into a black walnut forest, I'm going to spend a lot of time making sure I get exact measurements on those trees because it's high dollar, um, cost. So the, the money that I put in to measuring those trees, I'm going to see on the back end. Whereas the loblolly pine pulpwood trees, I'm not going to spend a lot of time making sure I get those measurements right because it's not high value. It's not worth a lot of money, so it's not worth a lot of time and effort. The goal of forest measurements, accurate and precise measurements. DBH and height, log form and quality, is it good, is it straight? Uh, we want to convert these to a volume estimate for our stand inventory, and then we can get value from that. And we're going to go through all that, um, but we're really going to focus on um, how do we get those beginning measurements. And then I'm going to show you how we have computer programs in now that help us get the rest of this information from our measurements. And then we put all that in reports because there's no job that you have that you don't have to write reports for. And then lastly, with our reports, usually what people are going to be interested in are the ideas of figures and tables. Show me some numbers. Show me what you did. Because nobody really wants to go out, out with you in the forest and walk around in the hot heat or in the freezing cold and the bugs and all that and watch you measure and just write down in a notebook. What they want to see is show me a figure that shows um, what's out there. Or show me a table that shows you know, dollar signs. That's what people are really interested in. The last part of the class is going to be focused on forest safety and fuels reduction techniques. And three specific areas I'm going to focus on are um, prescribed fire tools, herbicide tools, and chainsaws. So here's a, a basic, um, basic look at prescribed fire tools. Uh, this uh, right here is a drip torch and I'm going to show you the basic uh, parts and anatomy of a drip torch. Um, this is an old school belt weather kit. I'm going to show you uh, a kestrel which is the weather tool uh, used um, on the fire line uh, nowadays. And then the other basics in terms of uh, Nomex shirt and pants, gloves, uh, glasses, hard hat, uh, earplugs, um, little uh, face shield, uh, backpack, lots of water, um, maps, um, walkie-talkies, earplugs, all those sorts of things we're going to make sure 
uh, we understand what we need when we're doing uh, prescribed burn. In terms of uh, herbicide, uh, we want to know what herbicides we're using and making sure we're using the right herbicides for the right um, herbaceous plants. And we want to make sure we're putting in the right amounts of chemical and water and mixing them together and making sure we're mixing the right things together and we're not going to do anything that's going to hurt our cells, anybody else, or the um, plants or area that we're trying to treat. And then in terms of uh, operating a chainsaw, uh, there's definitely a safe way to do that and a right way to do that. There's definitely uh, the right type of clothing to be wearing. Uh, the chaps here, um, hopefully some really good boots. I would prefer long sleeves, but I understand not everybody does. Uh, face shield, ear protection, hard hat and helmet, um, maybe even some glasses. Two hands firmly on the saw, which is something I'm very big on. Um, there's proper ways to start it. There's proper ways to fuel it up. And there's a lot of things to know about operating a chainsaw um, in terms of making sure you do it right and that you don't hurt yourself or anybody that you're working with. Because it is uh, dangerous. And the more you understand that, the more you understand uh things that can go wrong, the more you understand all the different parts that are in there, the better you're going to be able to use a chainsaw safely and wisely and avoid any sorts of accidents. And so I got this quote right here from Aldo Leopold, who's somebody I definitely admire uh, in terms of conservation. And it says, my dog, by the way, thinks I have much to learn about partridges and being a professional naturalist, I agree. And the reason I got that in there is just the idea that uh, even, even if we know a bunch of stuff, there's still much we can learn. And there's still different uh, people out there who are experts, who have information, and can help us along the way. So um, I'm just hoping that you, uh, you're out there with your open mind and uh, ready to learn some more.